Namaste, and welcome to another episode of Yoga Vasishta. We're going to continue talking about the effects of reading and practicing Yoga Vasishta's teaching. He who arrives slowly at what is called living liberation, Jivan Mukta, who remains calm amid the endless turmoil, and who is quite aloof from common talk, has a mind that is calm and cool at everything. It is pure and full of heavenly light, shining serenely like the moonlit night in autumn. When the sun of reason illuminates the cloudless region of the mind, no ominous comet of evil can appear. All desires are at rest, with the elevated. They are pure with the steady and indifferent to the inert, like a body of light clouds in autumn. So this is the whole purpose of Yoga Vasishta, is to bring the reader to Jivan Mukta, living liberation. In other words, when one attains liberation or moksha, it's not that the whole world disappears <laughs> or that one simply becomes inert like a stone or gives up the body and disappears. Huh? Life goes on, but it goes on with a very different focus of consciousness. Instead of thinking, I am the ego, I am Mr. So-and-so, this is my job, this is my family, this is my country, or my politics, or my religion, or blah, blah, blah. All that false egoism goes away. And instead, one realizes, I am Brahman. I am pure consciousness, without desire. Now, because the prarabdha karma of the body is still in play. The body continues to exist for some time, even after enlightenment. My guru used to say, it's like when you turn off the fan. Huh? If the fan is going and you turn it off, it doesn't stop right away. It keeps going for some time and gradually winds down. So in the same way, when one becomes enlightened, one stops creating new karma. But the previous karma that was due still goes on and maintains the body for some time afterwards. So one performs the actions dictated by fate or destiny, which is another name for the prarabdha karma, the ripe karma of this lifetime. But one does it completely detached, like watching a movie show, watching a video that, oh, oh this is entertaining, <laughs> but it doesn't really matter. When the show is over, one is going to walk out of the theater or turn off the TV and walk away. So it doesn't really matter what happens in this life. It's simply the results of one's past life activities. It's not something to be attached to because it's a law of nature. Just like right now, it's the rainy season. So when it rains in the rainy season, you can't blame it. Huh? You can't get upset and say, oh, this rain is such an inconvenience. Oh, you can, but it's useless. Similarly, an enlightened person views the uh, comings and goings, the good and the bad, the pleasurable and the unpleasurable experiences of life with an equal eye. That nothing is good, nothing is bad. Nothing is right, nothing is wrong. No one can harm me and no one can help me. I am my own world. And what happens within my consciousness is simply a show. All phenomena are just a dream. And this dream is going by like our dreams at night. 
huh? without any real impact on me. I'm just the watcher, not the doer. This is the attitude of an enlightened person. And when one has that kind of attitude, he becomes serene, peaceful, undisturbed. Even when so many things are happening, huh? it doesn't really affect him. So this is the uh, freedom from evil that results from all desires being at rest. Even the plucking of a flower or tearing of its leaflet requires a little effort, but no exertion whatever is required to gain the blessed state. Plucking or pulling off a flower involves an action of the body, but in yoga there is no physical action. You have only to fix your mind. It can be practiced with ease by anyone sitting in his easy seat and fed with his usual food, who is not addicted to gross pleasures or breaching the rules of good conduct. You can derive happiness from your own observations at any place and time, as you can from your association with the good whenever it is available. So, I don't know how many times I've gotten in discussion with Hatha yogis huh? and told them, well, what you're doing isn't real yoga. <laughs> yes, it is. We're following Patanjali. Actually, no, you're not. You're not following Patanjali because in Patanjali's yoga system, which does include yoga asanas, it does include Hatha yoga exercises. First of all, before you begin the exercises, there are two stages, yama and niyama. And the first principle of yama, which means what to do, is to accept a guru. And these people almost never accept a guru. <laughs> and even when they do, it's just so they learn the exercises better. They become like gymnasts. <laughs> But the actual aim of Patanjali's system is self-realization. Chit Ananda. Huh? Chit Ananda means the bliss of consciousness. Chit Shakti is consciousness. And Ananda is bliss. So the aim of the yoga exercises, the asanas, is simply to sit nicely without any effort without any strain, so one can meditate. The meditation is the real thing. But even meditation is an effort. And the nature of that effort is to stop the vasanas, the impressions and desires in the mind. So our desires come from previous impressions or memories, which are stored in the mind and then come up again in association with the perceptions that we have it today. For example, we'll see a car and we think, oh, I need a car, I want a car. I want a car like that one. <laughs> but actually, we have no need for a car. The desire comes from the memory and it comes from the memory perhaps of riding in a car with someone else and thinking, oh, isn't it great? Wouldn't it be nice to have a car? and comparing ourselves with others. So all these mental activities that lead to unnecessary desires and actions should be given up. How do we give them up? By meditation. Meditation is an effort to stop the mind. But what if the mind is already stopped? What if one knows the secret of stopping the mind? The secret to stopping the mind is Atma Vichara. Atma Vichara means to inquire into what am I? Who am I? Who is the thinker? Who is the seer? Who is the doer? 
And so there are many different methods, beginning with karma yoga, bhakti yoga, raja yoga, jhana yoga, and so on. But all these yogas are efforts simply to stop the mind, to purify the desires, get rid of the vasanas, so that we can simply be who we really are. And who we really are is nothing but pure consciousness. So when one is aware of oneself as pure consciousness, you can sit in front of a blank wall and be happy. <laughs> you don't need things to enjoy. You don't need objects for your consciousness. Just consciousness itself is such a wonder, such a beauty that it becomes the fulfillment of one's entire life. And finally, I have already expounded to you, O Rama, the rule of good conduct. Now I will explain to you fully the way of gaining learning. Learning leads to fame, long life, and the acquisition of the object of your exertion. Therefore, the intelligent should learn the good sciences from those who have studied and mastered them. By hearing these lectures with a clear understanding, you will surely attain the state of perfection, just like dirty water is purified by infusion of kata fruit. A sage who has known the knowable has his mind drawn imperceptibly to the state of bliss. Once known and felt, the impression of that highest state of unbounded joy is hard to lose at any time. So try to understand this uh, learning process of going deeply into a big scripture like Yoga Vasishta uh, is not a waste of time. These aren't just irrelevant mythologies even though they may involve characters like Rama, whose existence has never been proven. That's all right. The story of Rama and his enlightenment is simply a framework for good instruction. The instructions of the wise, wherever they are found, are beneficial. Just like gold is still pure, even if it's found in the mud in the street, or in a filthy place. Huh? It's still gold. Similarly, knowledge of the truth is still valuable and effective, even if it's found in so-called mythology or in a fictional story. The story makes it nice to read, while these uh, wonderful instructions are easier to digest in that format. So don't think the less of Yoga Vasishta just because it has a, a, a noble and pleasant story. The story is part of the delivery. It's the sugar that helps the medicine go down. So like that, if you simply hear from someone who is realized, then you will certainly get the result. And what is that result? your mind will be drawn imperceptibly, little by little, to the state of bliss. And so, like so many people before, you will attain the enlightenment that is the cessation of all suffering. And that is the actual result or effect of uh, Yoga Vasishta. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Harihi Aung. Karunar Navamai Kardakadinalgum Aruna Chalashivam Yidam